Hello everyone and welcome back to Real History. I am your host Jared Frederick and in this very special interview segment I am joined by a great guest in the form of Sam Rosenthal. Th Sam, thanks so much for joining us on this episode. Thank you, Jared. Thanks for having me. <laughs> All right. And so let's introduce you a little bit further. Before we get into uh, some of the more detailed aspects of your acting career, I'd like to start out with the, the very personal connection that you have to Masters of the Air on two fronts. Um, please tell us about your family connection to this incredible story. Yeah, it's, um, it's a little surreal to say, but... Uh... The one of the pilots in the hundredth was my grandfather Robert Rosie Rosenthal. Um, yeah, and he is my dad's dad. That's uh, such such a, a profound family connection. And as I said in our pregame conversation, I had the chance to meet some of your family at the New York City premiere. Very brief and in passing, but I was very glad to have been able to shake their hands and, and make that connection in transit. Uh, so that's, uh, you go ahead. No, sorry. I'm, I'm just honored to have been invited to be part of your channel. I've been tracking what you've been saying about the show and you know, and have an immense amount of knowledge about this. Um, so I, I thank you for sharing with the world this important story and the key facts and the history with it. Thank you very much. Right back at you. Uh, so uh, your family connection is not the only connection, of course, though, that you have with Masters of the Air. Tell us uh, the other fun part of all this. Uh, the other fun part was that I had the honor and privilege to be cast as Lieutenant Arthur L. Jacobson um, in Masters of the Air. And uh, I got to be a part of this masterpiece and uh, be included, which is uh, quite a legacy. <laughs> yeah, I'll say so. Um, I'd, I'd like to, we're going to pivot back to that most most certainly. Um, I'd like to concentrate a little bit more on your family story for a, a bit though. Um, to what extent did you have knowledge of your grandfather's World War II experiences and did participating in this series change your views of him at all? Oh, good question. Um, I, growing up, I had no idea, no idea. I, we would attend these massive events and everybody wanted to shake my grandpa's hand, but, um, I, I wanted his attention. <laughs> I, I really, I, I, I got the goofy, the laughing side of him that, uh, is that core memory of my grandpa. Um, but I know he did something and him and my grandma, who um, I'd love to even touch on a little bit with this. Uh, I, I knew that they were important and people loved them. And I, I knew that my grandpa was involved in the war to what extent I had no idea. It didn't hit me until after his passing and um. I, I knew that there was a book that had information about my grandpa in it, and then another book, and then uh, a painting of my grandpa talking in front of all of these people looking at him in front of a plane. It, I, 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 these pieces started to come together, but when I got the opportunity to go to Thorpe Abbott's for the first time, I don't even know how many years ago at this point. It had to have been in 2009. Um, and to see my grandpa's setup and everybody just excited to meet parts of the family was uh, when the dots started connecting a little bit more. Um, that my grandpa did something really heroic. Hmm. I can really relate to that sort of family dynamic, because I feel that so many of us, the grandchildren and great-grandchildren of World War II veterans, live so much of our childhoods without having any comprehension of what they went through when they were only a little bit older than what we were at the time. Uh, so how old were you when he passed away? Uh, I was 11. Mm-hmm. Yeah. yeah. 
Well, I'm, I'm glad you got those 11 years with him uh, at, at the very least. I'm sure that that time is very special. Oh, I have a... I have a good story quick it's quick please do we uh we were hosting my family was hosting a passover dinner and my mom insisted that we get flowers so my grandpa volunteered and we took a quick ride to get the flowers but i just there was one thing i was good at it as a kid and it was talking a lot and i talked a lot <laughs> and the entire time i think my grandpa only said mm -hmm, and okay yes uh-huh we got back to the house afterwards. He said to my dad, this kid is a talker. I barely said anything. He's either going to be a great lawyer or a great actor one day. <laughs> uh, his, uh, his wisdom pulled through once again. <laughs> Do you have any uh, film footage of, of your grandfather? When was the last time you heard his voice? Um, I mean, we have like VHS recordings of him. Um, there was a little clip of, uh, my grandma was at my uh, bar mitzvah, but um, there was a little clip of him in my montage. And that's probably the last time I like, at any time I rewatched that is the last time I really heard him speak. And then in the process of the development of Masters, uh, once that got picked up and it started really happening, um, is when I started to get more familiar with my grandpa's voice and those his timing his cadence everything just started to come back together yeah you're ve you're very lucky to to have footage like that i'd give anything to have something like that with my grandfathers about their experiences and uh i just uh, a few days ago i found a an interview that your grandfather did probably 30 years ago and that i'll be sure to uh share with you if you haven't seen it before Absolutely. I, uh, I was able to take a quick look at what you, I watched the video that you posted, um, about the third episode. Uh, and I, if you have anything on my grandpa that I haven't seen, I would love to. I will happy, be happy to make that connection if at all possible. Uh, so let's uh, now circle back to the series itself. How, how did you come to be cast in Masters of the Air? Well, um, my family's been involved with it for give or take, uh, probably give more than 11 years to the development of Masters. Um, when it started to come up in conversation, I was still a kid and I was performing in school and auditioning and I did Sesame Street at that point and a, a few other a few other kids shows. And then um I'm not sure what the leap was, but when it started to actually become more and more real and my dad started to become more and more involved with as the president of the 100th Bomb, Gra Bomb Group Foundation yeah. and ta uh, taking initiative with a lot of that, I, 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 the timing kind of felt like his met where yeah. I was graduating school and, and uh this opportunity started to happen and then the world stopped and I finally got the call that they wanted to see a tape of me read for this role and I submitted it months later COVID and then I was able to fly out and be part of one of I want to say it was six Americans that were a part of the series that um were actors I should specify mm -hmm. yeah I'm privileged <laughs> yeah yeah most uh a lot like how uh with the pacific a lot of the actors were australian and in this case similar to band of brothers most of them are are british makes perfect sense yeah well an honor indeed to represent your country and uh in such a way for sure so we talked a lot about your grandfather who is a character Let's talk a little bit more about the man you portray, Arthur L. Jacobson. Uh, who is this man, and what did you come to learn about him as production was underway? Um, well, I, you know, I read Masters from cover to cover, and I, I've seen a ton of war films and interviews, and I, I got I got the general sense of these guys' age, especially being their age. I I, I had an idea of who these men or boys were. 
Did I have any real specifics about Jacobson? No, I, I had to do a lot of research on that end. Um, fortunately, there wasn't a lot because of how prisoner wars came into play here. Um, but I the the information that the Hundredth Bomb Group Foundation has on their website with all of the men and people who were a, a part of that group. Um, had some key information and I was able to find photos of him and mm. dive into a, a few of his missions and um, see what like his titles were, what he did on the planes and where he sat. Um, and I've been lucky enough to fly and go into B-17s before. So I was pretty familiar with the layout and knowing knowing the foundation of what he was doing. Mm -hmm. Yeah, oh, that's great. Well, and I I found uh, a little bit of a surprise in preparation for our interview because I too wanted to learn a little bit more about this gentleman. And I'll share with you right now, because I think it'd be fun to get your reaction. Uh, here is a newspaper clipping of him that I found. And this is How from the- How did you find this? This is uh, from newspapers.com. And uh, this is- Thought. June, yeah, June fifteenth, nineteen forty-four, from the Seattle Star. Mm. And so there he is. I'll be sure to send this on to you, as please, well. Please, that's amazing. But uh, yeah, so I thought uh, I thought it'd be helpful to our viewers compare these you know, two handsome faces um, here side by side. Yep, there you go. Well, you uh, you certainly did him great justice in the series. Uh, does he have any family who are around that you were able to connect with? I, I, that was one thing that I noticed about a lot of these actors and what I was able to do was I, I, I couldn't get in contact with any of them. Unfortunately, I wish, um, I, I the, the mass, uh, majority of my insight came from doing as much research as I possibly can on the, the internet <laughs> and yeah. trying to find obituaries or uh, even finding out what missions he was involved in um and trying to find the comparison between that and masters of the air the book and the scripts mm -hmm. well maybe with uh this episode of real history maybe a family member of uh, arthur jacobson is tuning in and we can make that connection one never knows please, with the magic of the internet please. Magic would, of the internet sometimes works in our favor. <laughs> yes, absolutely. Uh, so I, I don't suspect that there were a lot of other actors who were grandsons of real life portray people portrayed um, in the series. Um, how, how, how does that manner of personal connection make you feel? You've uh, touched on this a little bit. Perhaps we can elaborate on it uh, a little bit further. Yeah. Um, it's it's very surreal like i said keep saying um especially after having the opportunity to see myself and also meet and work with nate uh nate man he it it's just it's wild because we're we're the same age but then at the same time now i'm the same age as my grandfather mm -hmm. um i don't think that there were Obviously, there's legacy because that generation had so many people involved with the war, wherever they were in the wor world. Um, as far as like distinct relation to people involved in the hundredth, I don't. I think I'm maybe the only one involved in the making of Masters of the Air, let alone just being an actor. Um, and yeah, it felt like perfect timing. And the way that the everything, the pieces came came together. I don't know if that totally makes sense, but it was very a wild and very surreal moment where I could just constantly say thank you to my grandfather for making this, giving me this opportunity, but also for everything that he's done. Yeah. And I understand, too, that you and your family uh, traveled to the UK a few years ago to help with the dedication of an aircraft that was named after your grandfather's Rosie's Riveters. Uh, 
what was that like? And did, did that get you in the mood further for this film? Um, did, did that bring about further revelations? So going over to Milden Hall, um, which was the, the, the Air Force base, um, and it was very wild. It felt very official. Um, I've never been in a, a base like that before where it's in full action and there are all these people um, that know who my grandpa was. Mm. I've been to these reunions before and I hear the stories, I've seen the stories, but actually getting to Milden Hall and meeting these people and shaking their hand and thanking them for their service and then seeing a, a, an auditorium dedicated to my grandpa and uh, then finding out that there's nose art that is has my grandfather's portrait um, was a, a dream come true in a sense that I, I might not have the same courage or charisma that my grandpa had, but to be able to carry on his legacy was, especially in a place of such importance, was, it, it's, it's a core memory that stays close to my heart. That's wonderful. We've talked a little bit about some of the research uh, that you've done. I'd, I'd like to delve into a little bit more of some of the additional preparation that you did for the role. And, you know, anything's on the table here. Did you do any boot camp, any sort of specialized training? And I think uh, even greater interest, how did you and your family help Nate Mann portray this person who you knew and loved so well? Yeah. Um, so I'll touch on what my training was. I, I, I didn't participate in the boot camp just because of the timing of COVID and the pandemic and want the, how eager this production was coming into um, development. But uh, while I was back in New York and just training consistently and getting my mind ready, watching as many war films and series mm. that I possibly can, learning the dialect even. Um, and it still didn't put the pieces together of what these boys went through until I was fully mentally prepared as an actor, what my experience was up in the air and what that, that, what that must have felt like. And I woke up in the middle of the night and I realized <laughs> how that must have felt. Um, being in those freezing temperatures and seeing your own breath and fearing for your life that I it's it's a suicide mission is uh, was a like a light bulb moment and it was an epiphany um that was probably the most exciting part of my character development uh with with creating and bringing as much life into Jacobson as I possibly could. Um, but as far as Nate's performance, I met Nate uh, initially at the, at Playtone Studios. Um, and he, when he met us, he, it was me and my dad and he was so excited. He just, he was ready. He wanted to dive in and hearing about his audition process where he initially auditioned for Clevin and the role just, he, he landed so much more in the charming way that Rosie led. And it was a, a light bulb moment where he really wanted it. He knew more about this type of person and getting to see him be so excited about it made us more excited. And then I saw him perform and that kid's a talent. He is embodies my grandfather. While I didn't know him at that age, mm. I see it. How profound! That's that's just great, and I, I look forward to seeing his performances uh, in those episodes. Most definitely, absolutely. So, what uh, what was I, I've seen a lot of photos and a, a lot of behind the scenes footage of the set and. 
the production value of this series is just through the roof and the level of authenticity um, that was solved down to the recreation of the officers club exactly as it looked uh, what was it like to be on the set of this mammoth production so uh, over the years when i was a child to where i am now i've had the privilege to go to thorpe abbott's several times um and uh I, you've you do you feel comfortable explaining what thorpe abbott's is um Oh, sure. Yeah. And I, I, I presume that a lot of our viewers are already familiar with uh, it is, but that's, that's where the, where the 100th bomb group was based in England. Yeah. Um, and I, there's a, a memorial there that is beautifully upkept and run and led by some of the most incredible people that take incredible care there. And if anybody has the opportunity to actually visit it, um, they, they should in a heartbeat. Um, and going there and seeing where my grandfather stood, what he was doing, where his bunk was, where, where they had these meetings, where they had recovery, um, and medical care. It was where, where my grandfather had com specific conversations that are noted and talked about. And even where my grandfather stood years after and just, was able to give memorial to what he did um and the stories i hear of him crying while he's over there and mm. the cathartic release that he had yeah. by making the foundation a, a a thing um what is was very surreal to go from that and then be on that set where it didn't feel like a set it felt like I was back on Thorpe Abbott's, but time traveled yeah. <laughs> uh, in a 2021 car, <laughs> um, but seeing the bicycles, seeing the, the buildings, the architecture, seeing the tower and uh, the, the, the parts of the planes and these, these massive, massive, but like wings and uh, flax everywhere. It was just, it was, it was amazing. Um, very mind boggling. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. I can only imagine. And I, I've, I've heard some stories from some other actors in interviews that, you know, the actors got maps when they arrived on set because oh, yeah. it was, it was such, just such a huge set um, that was like a real air base to an extent. It could be somewhat difficult to navigate. I, I still, if you asked me to get from one point of the set to the other point of the set, I just would say, can you take me? <laughs> <laughs> well, uh, speaking of navigation and location, where can viewers spot you in the series as they watch it? I am in the infamous Regensburg mission, um, and it is in episode three, um, and I am in Austin Butler who plays Gail Clevin, um, Bucky, uh, in, in his, uh, in his plane. <laughs> what was it like to work with Austin Butler? Oh, I mean, the four, I, there, I met so many amazing actors while I yeah. was there. Um, it, it's very, very wild to say that I'm part of a series. Uh, my, my first major project was with Austin Butler and it, it was humbling <laughs> um they're so tall <laughs> all of them are so tall i'm five foot nine and they're well over six feet so i was like <laughs> my neck was hurting i it just they're they're such pros and they reek of stardom and they care so much about this project and thought mm -hmm. it was wild to have me there and involved um and it just was nice to get to know them as people, but also get to see what they they also do best. Mm, yeah, that's great. And you you're in episode three, and I was just astounded by episode three. Uh, it was uh, intellectually insightful and emotionally fatiguing. I think is the best way to put it. Uh, and 
what what a privilege to for you to be in such a, a hallmark piece of television. Uh, that's I, I I can't imagine uh, how how proud you must be of your work in it. It's a it's a dream come true, and I yeah give a nod to Playtone, um, John Orloff, and uh, Apple for letting me be a part of this um, masterpiece. I yeah. I can definitely say that. <laughs> yeah, and uh, an additional hat tip to Apple for helping to facilitate this great conversation yes. that yes. we're having right now. Uh, so you uh, you had mentioned that you revisited a lot of war films and and perhaps some classics of the genre um what were some movies that you did watch and what is your your favorite war film other than masters of the air of course <laughs> i might be a little biased with it yeah um i don't know i there's so many movies uh i i, I lived in the realm of band of brothers for so long um just because it's it is one of those greats and there isn't a single flaw with that series um also i wanted to see how they made it and put it together and it's the one of the greatest production companies that i've i'm lucky to be associated with um that that story in particular was really impactful to my perspective of war films and television and how it's depicted um but i'm gonna have to say saving private ryan which was mm -hmm. the launching point for all of it yeah uh, that i mean that opening sequence you hear it time and time again how it can easily trigger people but the way that film is directed, portrayed, edited, acted, every moment in that film is accurate to me. Mm -hmm. um, and really, <laughs> if you don't already are, if you're not already diagnosed with anxiety, that's, that's one way to get it. Mm. <laughs> yeah. Um, yeah, it's, but even not just in film, but watching these guys talk about it who have suppressed their emotions and watching these uh, documentaries and hint it, interviews is um, also really impactful for preserving that history. Yeah, absolutely. And I think to your point, Saving Private Ryan was foundational for <laughs> everything that followed, not only in the realm of cinema, but the National World War II Memorial, the National oh, yeah. World War II Museum. Uh, Hanks and Spielberg were intimately involved in all of that. It certainly speaks to the power of Hollywood, undoubtedly. Yeah. Absolutely. Well, and on the point of Hollywood, as we start to wrap things up here in our conversation, uh, tell all of our viewers about your professional background, your other film projects, uh, other things that you've worked on, other things that you'd like to work on in the future. Yeah, uh, I am getting my foot in this industry, especially now that I've, I, I, I grew up doing theater. Um, it was my first passion and I did a little bit of film. I, I have family that's involved in the entertainment industry and watching animation and the Disney was a very prevalent in part of my childhood, but after doing going through college and uh, getting the practical experience on television and film, I fell in love with the, that side of the industry. And I've been pursuing it since. And uh, I am, it's, it's, it's a brutal time right now for the industry and we've been uh, through it, but we're on the other side of it. And I'm excited for what's to come. I don't know what's what's to come, but I'm I'm optimistic and uh, pressing forward. I've got wonderful representation that uh, believes in me as much as I believe in them. So, yeah, fantastic. Yeah, I suspect you have a, a bright future ahead of you in regard to acting. Thank you. Is uh before I ask you your final question, is there anything else you'd you'd like to add or anything else that comes to mind? Any good anecdotes from the sets, meaningful conversations that you had or anything that we might have left out? Yeah, I, um, 
my grandfather's story is so powerful. And the constant note that I hear is, can you believe what he did? And I, I think what Masters does is sets up the story of my grandfather beautifully, but he did so much more than just fly a couple of times. Um, I mean, his, his entire story of going to law school, enlisting and wanting to fight for persecution, not just because he was a Jew, but because that's yeah. what his heart was behind, um, to flying 52 missions and not giving up, and then seeing an ad and saying that he's going to be a prosecutor in the Nuremberg War Trials, yeah. where on the way over, he was getting ready to go onto the ship and saw my grandmother. Um, 10 days later, they were married. Yep. And she was- Phyllis, right? Her. Phyllis, Phyllis. Yeah. Phyllis. <laughs> She's, uh, it, it's, it's, for lack of a better term, it's a badass story. And both of them are well-deserving of their acknowledgement. They both be humbled and shy and embarrassed probably by the limelight but they are some of the most deserving people i've ever met yeah and, and nate mann i believe made this very point at the new york city premiere that I, I had the chance to go to and he said that rosenthal's story is worthy of a movie all by itself and i i think there weren't there weren't truer words spoken on that stage uh that evening um that what an incredible family story and legacy we've got to we've got to make that happen and uh fingers crossed <laughs> that i i can i can fill those shoes one day <laughs> that'd be great my last question for you today please what was the most important thing that you learned while helping to make this series the most important thing is um the, while making it or where we're at right now because it's 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 only evolved um over time i i think that timing is key and the importance of knowing what happened and what happened in our history is so prevalent and important and one thing it taught me and instilled in me is I, I was always curious why my dad idolized my grandpa so much, but it, the dots finally made and preserving that history and getting to share his story and the story of hundreds and hundreds of men that were involved with this and women is, and people even today are, are is, is mind blowing. And yeah, that, that's, that's probably the most important uh, the piece of information and takeaway that I had through this experience. Yeah, no, I think it's a good answer. And as I always try to stress in the classroom, uh, history is always best delivered through the lens of the personal. And I think that Masters of the Air succeeds in that in a very big way. And it's in no small part uh, due in thanks to the likes of the Rosenthal family for carrying on the work and helping to promote that story for fellow families and also future generations. So Sam, I, I thank you. I thank your family. I appreciate you. I appreciate the work of all within the Rosenthal family. And uh, thanks to Apple TV Plus for helping to make this interview a reality. Absolutely. And thank you. Thank you for uh, sharing the good word and doing everything that you're doing. And your insightfulness is uh, key to the world. Well, thank you. I, I try my best every day, as we must. All right. Thank you again. Thank you. Thanks for having me. That wraps up this episode of Real History. We look forward to seeing you next time as we continue to analyze Masters of the Air and other great historical films. Take care. <laughs>